a bodybuilder one day went to Africa. He was doing a tour of Africa. He was one of these hugely buffed guys, and he was doing a tour, and they went to a little village, and they thought they would entertain the villagers by letting him do a lot of his profiles of physique. And so he did all of these different turns and twists and muscles were bulging and it was quite an impressive performance that this tribe had never seen before, this kind of uh, bodybuilding exposition. After he was completed, the tribal chief said to him, he said, that really looked good. That was extremely impressive. He said, I I don't know that I've seen that many muscles on a man before. He said, what else do you use all of that for? (laughs) To which the bodybuilder, this was his profession, he said, well, nothing else. To which the tribal chief said, what a waste. To have all that muscle and not use it. What a waste to have all this armor and not use it. The Apostle Paul has said to the church at Ephesus and to us that your struggle is not against the physical world. Verse 12 of chapter 6, flesh and blood. That's where it is expressed. That's not where it's rooted. That's merely where the fruit manifests itself. It's not against the physical world, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and world forces of this darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Whatever is plaguing you today emanates from the spiritual realm. So if you and I do not address the cause, you can't get to the cure. The enemy doesn't want you to know or take seriously that it emanates from the spiritual realm because then you might address it spiritually. As long as he can keep you dealing with the fruit and bypass the root, he can keep you hostage. Paul says, your wrestle is in another realm. It's in heavenly places. And because your battle is in the spiritual realm, that's where your fight must be. But the good news is, is he tells you to stand firm because in that realm, Jesus has already gotten victory. In the spiritual realm, regardless of what you're going through in the physical realm, in the spiritual unseen realm, Jesus Christ has already gotten victory. You are victorious in the invisible, even though you may be thoroughly defeated in the visible. So if you want to be victorious in the physical like you are in the spiritual, you must address the physical spiritually. If you don't address the visible physical spiritually, then you have a victory that you're not experiencing because of how the physical is dominating. One of the toughest things for God to get his people to do is to look at life and live life from the spiritual frame of reference and not from the reference point of the five senses. He has given us equipment with which to do that. He comes to verse 18 in Ephesians 6 and he says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf. I want you to notice how many times the word or a synonym for prayer is used in that short segment. All prayer and petition, pray. Comes to the end of it, petition for all the saints. Beginning of verse 19, and pray. He closes out this segment with a call to prayer or what I call putting on the armor. How do you put on the armor? How do you wear 
what God has given us for victory. How do we grab it, get it, hold on to it? And he tells you in verse 18 and following, he says, the answer is prayer. Now the question is, what is it? We talk about prayer, we speak about it, we do it. But I want to take us a little deeper to make sure we understand it. Because when you understand prayer, it changes that you pray, how you pray, whether you pray, and your expectations having prayed. For far too many people, even Christians, prayer is like the national anthem before a football game or baseball game. It gets the game started, but has absolutely no relevance to what's happening on the field. It is an exercise in um, habit. Most of us, for example, when we pray before we eat, really don't need our minds to do that. Because it's going to be the same thing we say every day. Lord, bless this food and nourish it to our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of us really don't need our minds when we go to bed. If we're tired, you know, bless me, bless my family, give me a good night's sleep, you know, protect me during the night, wake me up tomorrow, in Jesus' name, amen. It is carrying forth an expectation and a routine without meaning. For many of us, prayer is like um, a spare tire. We want it there in case we really need it. But if we don't need it, as long as it's back there somewhere and we can whip it out, particularly in an emergency, then we need it. But I want to explain what Paul wants to explain, which is why he uses it so many times in this verse, coming at the end of this section. Because if you understand prayer in the context of this section, it will change whether you pray and in fact how you pray and it will change what you get when you pray. Simply defined, I would like to define prayer as earthly permission for heavenly interference. Earthly permission for heavenly interference. It is earth giving heaven permission to interfere or to intervene in what is happening in my world of reality from the spiritual point of view. Prayer is giving heaven permission to intervene. Now, that raises the question, why does heaven need permission? Why, why must I give heaven permission? There's a whole theology behind this, but to sum it up, you have to understand how God organized the world to work. He organized the world to work through people. Therefore, when he created Adam and Eve, he said, let them rule. So God has given us rulership over the earth. And he joins us when invited to do so. In other words, there are certain things God's going to do because, you know, he's God and he can do it. But there are many things and maybe even most things that God does not intervene on unless requested. Because he wants to know you want him. You need him, desire him, and have expectations of him. And so he does not intervene or participate unless requested to do so. Because God has given you and me the right to leave him out. You can leave him out. You can, you can put him on the shelf. You can act independently of him. Let me explain something. Prayer doesn't make God do anything. Okay? Prayer doesn't force him, cajole him, if God doesn't plan to do it, I don't care how much you pray about it. Prayer does not force God's hand. But what prayer does is it calls on God to intervene 
in ways he wants to intervene anyway, but won't do it until requested to do so. Let me show you what I mean, for example. If you look at, well, let me show you two passages right quick on this. First of all, James, the end of the book of James. He says in James chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. He says pray for one another so that you may be healed. In other words, he makes a condition of the healing, the prayer. Then he makes a general statement. The effectual prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. The effectual prayer, and we'll tell you how to make your prayers effectual in a moment, but the effectual prayer of a righteous man, a man who's living to please God, accomplishes much. Not a little, a whole lot. Elijah, verse 17, was a man with a nature like ours. In other words, don't say, I wish I was back in the Old Testament because God did all that stuff back there for them. He says, Elijah was just like you. He had a nature, he was a man, he was human. And he prayed earnestly, effectually, that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced fruit. It says he's an ordinary man, just like you and me. Elijah has nothing on you. He had a like nature, just a regular man. But he was a righteous man and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it stopped raining for three years. He prayed again that it would rain and it rained and then produced fruit or produced results on earth because of course that's what rain does. It allows vegetation and fruit to grow. So he says that this ordinary man got heaven to move because rain comes from up there. There was a problem on earth. He called on heaven and heaven moved. But I want to take you back to when he prayed. So turn back to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18 verse 1. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Okay. Now all we read in James in the New Testament was that he prayed it would not rain and stop. Then he prayed that it would rain and it started. That's all James tells us. But the Bible tells us that we ought to compare scripture with scripture. So now I'm taking you back to when he prayed that it would rain. God said in chapter 18 verse 1, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. What did God say he was going to do? He said he was going to send rain. The sovereign God said this is what I'm going to do. Now in chapter 18, if you go over to verse 41, now Elijah said to Ahab, he was told to go show himself to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. And Ahab went up to eat and drink. But Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked. He said, there is nothing. And he said, go back seven times. He came about at the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot, go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy shower and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. Now there's a whole bunch here. Let me just give you the cliff notes. 
God said it's going to rain. So watch this. When Elijah prayed, he only prayed about what God said. In other words, he wasn't just making up stuff on the spot. God said it was going to rain. But wait a minute. What God said didn't come true until he prayed. Even though God declared it in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm, no rain hit earth until it got called down for from Elijah. In other words, prayer called down what God already had intended to do. Prayer didn't make God do something he hadn't planned to do. God had already told him, I planned for it to rain. All prayer did was call it down. And it was an interesting way he prayed. It says he crouched down on his knees and put his head down. Now that may not be much to you, but it means a whole lot back in the Old Testament. Because when a pregnant woman was getting ready to give birth, they didn't have stirrups like we had it today. It would be travail. It would be pushing out what had grown in. When Elijah got down on his knees, he was getting in a travail position because he was pulling out of heaven that which heaven intended to do until he got pushed down to earth. And he pushed seven times. Mm. Seven times until that baby got birth called rain. In other words, All Elijah's prayer did was grab what God had already intended to do and bring it down to earth. Prayer is not making God do something he never planned to do. Prayer is grabbing what God intended to do and driving it down to earth. But it doesn't happen on earth just because it's already intended in heaven. It happens on earth because it was grabbed by earth when heaven has already declared it to be and brought it down to earth by our participation with it. What I'm trying to say is when Paul says to pray, he is not just saying have have these general, meaningless, repetitious, empty conversations and think that because you threw God's name out, it was something significant. He says what makes it significant is you understand what prayer is. It is earthly permission for heavenly interference predicated on the fact that this is what heaven intended to do. Prayer, let me put it another way. Your problem is in heavenly places. Prayer takes you there. Prayer is the human means of entering in to the supernatural realm in order to utilize the armor. When you look back at Ephesians chapter 6 and you look at the last piece of armor before he even talks about prayer, notice what it is. He says that we are to use the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. In other words, the best way to pray is when you throw God's word back at him. You see, he knew he could pray for rain because he had heard the word of God about rain. So he knew what to expect because he knew what God had said. Having known what God has said and praying in light of what he says gives you authority in the spiritual realm. Let me put it another way. If you don't know what God has said (laughs) or you don't know what to expect from God, then you will pray vague prayers You will pray empty prayers and the armor won't seem to work because you're not connecting it with the spiritual realm in which it operates. He says, I want you to make contact with God. Flesh and blood. See, we we spend all of our time talking to men about God and very little time talking to God about men. We spend a lot of time talking 
to and about our circumstances. We'll talk on the phone. We'll talk to people who usually can't solve our problem. We're looking for sympathy. And so we talk to folks who can sympathize with us. But what you need are answers, not sympathy. What you need is heaven to invade earth. When you throw God's stuff back at him in a thing called prayer, you're not making God do something. You are simply receiving by faith what he's already planned to do. That changes the power of prayer. You know, we've got, we've got radio and TV signals all around us. All around us, there are signals, there are signals in the, in the air, right here in this building. There are radio waves and there are TV signals and they're all around us. But we're not hearing any music and we're not seeing anything on the TV screen. Why? Because we don't have anything right now to pull it down. In other words, if you turn on the radio right now, what's invisible will become visible. You'll be able to hear it. If you, if you had a TV set plugged in, you would be able to see it because you have something to receive it. In other words, you need something in the physical to receive the waves in the invisible. Even if you don't have a radio and don't have a television, the waves are still operating. They're still all over the place. They're still surrounding us. But the lack of something to grab it and receive it and bring it to the physical keeps you from knowing it's there. God is moving. God is all over the place. The spiritual realm is totally surrounding you right now. There are angels in this room. There are demons in this room. The invisible realm is all over you right now. You just can't see it and you can't feel it until you draw it down okay until you draw it down and so so what he is saying is prayer is the means of contacting the invisible spiritual realm and bringing it down to the visible physical realm and that is the way you engage the armor and put the armor to work now let's look at what he says here in chapter 6 he says with all prayer and partition, pray at all times in the spirit. Now, watch this. He says, pray at all times. There are two Greek words for time. Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is simply time in general. It's seconds to minutes, minutes to hours, hours to days, days to weeks, weeks to months, months to years. That's Kronos. That's just time. General time. We exist in time and we exist linearly in time. Time moves forward. That's Kronos. It's just the general concept of time. But Kronos is not the word for time here. The Greek word for time here is Kairos. That has to do with a specific, specified time. If I say, Kairos, if I say, I'm going to meet you at 12 o'clock, that's not time in general. That's time specific. That's a certain time, a specific time. And if I tell you I'm going to meet you at 12 o'clock, you know what that means? There's a reason why we're meeting. Because if I, if I make an appointment, that means I'm meeting you for a purpose. So it is a specific time, an opportune time, or an appointed time. Kairos is the word used here, not Kronos. When he says, I want you to pray at all times, he's not talking about 24 hours a day, you having this uh, verbal conversation with God. He's talking about all opportune times, all specific times, all appointed times. That's what the word means. Why would he be using kairos instead of chronos? There's a chronos concept, pray without ceasing. That is always stay in communication with God. But that's not what he says here. He says, I want you to pray at all kairos times, appointed times, scheduled times, opportune times, specific times. Why is he being so specific when he talks about your communication with God here? Because of the context in which this discussion about prayer occurs. 
It occurs in the context of spiritual warfare. It occurs in the context of putting on spiritual armor. And notice the real context that it occurs in, in verse 13. Take on the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. He's talking about the evil day. That's the day when all hell breaks loose. That's the day when you feel like you're going to lose your mind. That's the day when nothing's going right. That's the day when you, you're just not going to make it. That's the day when you wonder, how am I going to get through another day? Because you're under attack. Some days you don't go through that. Some days the day is fine and you may have a little thing go wrong here, and a little thing go wrong there. But overall, life is good and life is, life is going okay. But you and I know some days are not like that. Some days it looks like the devil's riding your back. Looks like everywhere you turn, something is going wrong. It looks like every direction you look in, God is invisible and is nowhere to be found. That's the evil day. That's the day when evil has descended upon you, trying to own you, dominate you, and dictate to you. He says on that day, at that time, when you're under that kind of attack, you need this kind of prayer. Because that day demands the armor of God be worn by you in all of God's power brought to bear on your circumstances. What he is calling for is specific prayer, concentrated prayer, Elijah kind of prayer where you have to throw God's stuff back up at him so that he can re-intervene into your circumstances. One of the reasons we don't see God show up is that we don't earnestly talk to God when we need him. We got these vague prayers that we've been saying for 25 years, okay? But let me tell you something about when all hell breaks loose. When all hell breaks loose, you have a unique ability to get specific. See, when everything's going right, going well, it's easy to be general. You know, thank you Lord for blessing me, you know. But when all hell breaks loose, you got specific stuff jacking you up. You got specific things that are causing you headaches and heartaches and life aches. And he's calling you in those specific times. That is the time to call on God and he says how you are to do it. He says you are to call on him in the spirit. In the spirit. Let me say it another way. You are to call on him spiritually. You are to call on him spiritually. Now, there's the opposite of spirit is flesh. So maybe if I say pray in the flesh and do the negative, you'll understand what he means by pray in the spirit. To pray in the flesh is simply to mouth words coming out of your humanity with no spiritual attachment to them. It is simply my humanity. It's generally how we say grace. Most prayers or many prayers when we say grace are prayers in the flesh. They're just routine things that we say because we know we're supposed to say grace before we eat with no spiritual attachment. That is no spiritual connection to it. To pray in the spirit means that you're making a spiritual connection to the communication that you want to take place with God. Now, you can do that in a number of ways. You can quote scriptures in your prayer, or you can take a principle of scripture and place it in front of God. See, when you tell God, God, remember you said, you would supply all my needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And I got this emergency situation going on right now. But the reason I'm talking to you is because you said that when I was in this, you said, I've never seen the righteous nor the seed begging bread. You said, you see, see, when you pray spiritually, because the Bible says God's words are spirit, and you bring spiritual truth into your conversation with God, you are now praying in the spirit. You are praying spiritually. You're not just playing fleshly or randomly or, or routinely or rotely. You are now calling on God, bringing the spirit to bear in the conversation. Now, let me tell you what happens when you pray spiritually. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. When you pray spiritually, when you pray bringing the spiritual to bear. 
in the situation. He says, this whole chapter is about the Spirit of God, Romans chapter 8. And he wants us to know that the Spirit is at work. He says, let me look at a couple of verses. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth until now. So again, this childbirth thing, this groaning, this aching, this labor pain. He says, and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Anybody here ever groan? In other words, because circumstances in life got you going, mm, oh, ah, life is hurting you and you're groaning, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and, and redemption of the body. Verse 26, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now this is when you're groaning and don't know what to say. It's not got that bad. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints, watch this, according to the will of God. So what he says is when you bring what you know to be the will of God into the presence of God and you are groaning, the Holy Ghost groans with you. And because he knows how deep the problem is, how deep the need is, how bad the attack is, he comes alongside and helps a brother out, helps a sister out in your weak moment when you can't make it another day. But you bring spiritually into the presence of God, the spirit takes over and he lifts you up in a way you cannot lift yourself up and neither can anybody you know lift you up. So why do you want to pray in the spirit? You want to pray in the spirit because he knows the territory. You want to pray in the spirit because he knows what's happening up there in the invisible realm. He knows what the evil one is doing to you. He's calling you to pray in the spirit. Let let me show you how this thing works because I think this will help us in our prayer and make my prayer more dynamic and more real instead of more rote and more boring. For many of us, uh, a prayer is a boring thing because we don't understand what's happening in the invisible And if you understood what's happening in the visible, it wouldn't be boring anymore. So let me show you Daniel chapter 9. I know we're turning to a number of verses today, but I want you to understand this principle so that you and I can experience the power of prayer. Daniel chapter 9. In the book of Daniel, Daniel is a man after God's heart. And in Daniel chapter 9, look at verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the book of number of years, which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Okay, so he's reading the Bible. Says he read the book of Jeremiah. He was reading the Bible and he observed something. He observed what the scripture says, verse 3. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God. Okay. He read what God said, then he talked to God about it. Okay. So he found out the mind of God, the thoughts of God from the word of God, and then he talked to God about what God said. Okay, now you're praying in the spirit. Whenever you bring God's stuff back at him, you're praying in the spirit. So why do you want to study the Bible? Well, one is to know more about God, but the other is to throw God's stuff back up at him. He prays in the spirit, okay? Now, go down to verse 20. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain to my God. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, that's the angel, whom I had seen in the vision previously came to me in my extreme weariness because he was tired and the time of the evening offering, he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight and understanding. Wait a minute now. He read the word, then he talked to God about the word he read, 
then God sent an angel to say, let me help you understand some stuff. Because a lot of us could get through what we're going through if we just understood what was going on. But because, like Marvin Gaye, we just want to know what's going on, and we don't know what's really going on, we don't make the connection to what God says and our communication with God. Notice, he didn't send the angel to give him understanding about his situation until he prayed. But he didn't pray until he found out what God had to say. He found out what God had to say, he prayed, God sent the messenger to give him understanding. Look at verse 23, this is going to get good here in a minute. He says in verse 23, at the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, a righteous man, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. All right, now watch this. He says, uh, you, 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 don't miss this. He says, when you prayed, the command was given for me to come. All right, watch this now. When you prayed, the command was given for me to come. Now turn to chapter 10, verse 10. Then behold, a hand touched me, set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O oh, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words which I am about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. Notice, I came because of your words. But your words were tied to God's words. So when you brought your words, hooked them up to God's words, God sent me to talk to you about what you talked to God about. But watch this. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Uh-oh. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princesses, Michael the archangel, came to help me. For I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days for the vision pertains to days yet future. All right, let me break this down. He's reading the word and God says something that grabs him. He's reading the prophet Jeremiah and the words jump off the page. And he says, well, wait a minute, this applies to me. He then gets on his knees and talks to God about what he just read. So he's now in the spirit because he's bringing God to bear on the situation. Twice it says, on the day you prayed, God sent the answer. All right, watch this now. See, because there are a lot of people here wondering why God's taking so long. Uh, he told Daniel, your prayer was answered the very day you prayed it. Now, why was your prayer answered the day you prayed it? Because you're highly esteemed, you're a righteous man, and you're praying according to the word. When you're a righteous person praying according to the word, it doesn't take long for God to answer your prayer. In fact, he says, God answered it on the same day that you ask it. But there was a three-week delay. You and God answered it the same day, but it says it took me 21 days to deliver it to you. Now, let me tell you about God's post office. God's got a post office. He got some mailmen. These mailmen called angels, their job is to deliver the answer to you. Everybody's been assigned an angel who's a Christian. If you're a Christian, you've got an angel assigned to you, and that's your personal mailman. And that job, the job of that angel is to deliver God's answers to you. When you, based on the word, communicate with God in prayer, as a righteous person, you're just like Elijah, you're calling down from heaven on earth a need that heaven needs to address. But there was a three-week delay of the angel. Okay, Gabriel, why was there a three-week delay? 
There was a three week delay because a demon showed up. He says the prince of Persia, that's a demon because he calls himself as an angel, a prince. He says the demon over Persia, which is where you're living, the demon that's hovering around where you're living was there and he blocked me as I was trying to deliver to you on the same day that you ask it, the demon, you see, unless you know what's happening in the invisible world, all you see is God's not answering my prayer in the visible world. He said, but Daniel, I want you to understand what's going on. This was a demon and the demon lived where you're living. The demon lived in your neighborhood. The demon lived in Persia, which is where you're living. Just like God has a post office, to deliver your answer, hell has a post office to block the delivery. Hell wants to keep the delivery away. So now you got a battle between angels that's stopping you from getting the answer to your prayer. It's not that God hasn't answered your prayer. He answered it the day you prayed your prayer. But because there is a battle in the heavenlies, there is warfare in the spiritual realm, that's why that is the delay. So the question is not, God, why haven't you answered my prayer? It's how do we work out this spiritual warfare so the answer that you've given gets to me? He says, I was coming down and the demon or the prince of Persia that is set up to block the answer that I was to deliver to you, he blocked me. And we were rumbling for three weeks. But then God sent Michael, he big angel in charge, he sent Michael down to give a brother some help. And when he sent Michael down, now if God had to call Michael, that means the demons were rough. So he has to call Michael. Michael and Gabriel double team the dude. Get him out of the way so that he could deliver the blessing. Now, here's why you got to keep praying. Don't keep praying to get God to answer. If it's based on his word and grace has already provided everything you're supposed to get, you don't keep praying to get God the answer. You are now praying for God to intervene to keep Satan from blocking the answer he's already given. So now you're praying in faith. When you pray according to God's word and you're calling on God according to his word, you don't have to ask him over and over and over and over again for the same thing. If it's according to his word, once you ask him sincerely, the rest of your prayers are thank you for answering, thank you for answering, thank you for answering because you already answered the day I delivered it. And the reason I got a delay is there's stuff going on in the spiritual world that's giving me my delay. It's not that God has an answer. God is good on his word. He's good on his promises. He can be depended upon. So you keep praying because you're trying to break through the delivery that was already granted. And that's why you can spend time giving thanks because God answers when you ask based on his word. It's good stuff. This good stuff. This is This will make you want to pray. He says back in Ephesians, let me wind this up. He says back in Ephesians, all prayer, all time, all perseverance. And look at what he says. He says in verse 18, he says, here's what I want you to do. With this in view, be on alert. Be on alert. Translation, pray with your eyes open. Okay? Be, keep your eyes open. That's, that's what it means. Do, do you know most prayers in the Bible are not with eyes closed? I mean, we know that. We know we do that to kind of concentrate or to, to show reverence. But most of the time when people pray, the Bible says, and they lifted their eyes. Okay? Eyes were open. Okay? He says, keep your eyes open. What are you keeping your eyes open for? Look, look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 
He wants us to pray with our eyes open. And he says in 1 Peter, these words. Be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Keep your eyes open. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He says, the devil is trying to eat you up like a roaring lion. But a lot of people don't know when lions roar. Lions don't roar when they're coming up on their prey. Uh Uh-uh, they don't roar then. Lions roar after they get their prey. It's when they get you, they are, they, they roar. In other words, it's their declaration of victory. They roar after the fact, not before the fact. You have to be on alert because they creeping up on you until they pounce on you. After they pounce on you and devour you, they roar because of the victory. He says, keep your eyes open when you pray. Because when you're calling down heaven, hell wants to block that. So keep your eyes open that is spiritually open to see what's going on around you. Because when you are talking to heaven, hell wants to block that. That is why so many times when you're trying to pray, distractions show up. So many times when you're trying to pray, you're sleepy. So many times when you're trying to pray, something pops up because the lion does not want you to interfere with his trying to block the answer from getting to you. And that's why you got to pray with your eyes open. That's why you got to you, you gotta do it. You know, if you go to Jerusalem, you'll see the Jews up at the wailing wall and they got the Bible in front of their hand and you see them doing this. You see them doing that at the wailing wall. Okay? The reason that they're doing that is so they don't go to sleep. If they keep moving so that they stay alert and stay awake as they communicate with God at the wailing wall. That's the reason they do that. He say, pray with your eyes open because when you talk to heaven, your prayer giving heaven permission is so powerful that the enemy does not want that prayer to go through. And so he's going to try to distract you from praying. He's going to try to dilute you from praying. He's going to cause something to come up to interfere with your prayer. You thought that was just chance or luck or distraction. No, it wasn't. It was a lion trying to keep you from being able to get a breakthrough that you've been looking for for so long that was already approved in heaven a long time ago. Two men heard that they were giving um, $5,000 bounties for capturing or killing wolves. $5,000 per wolf. Boy, let's become bounty hunters for these wolves. So he and his friend decided to become bounty hunters and to capture woods, $5,000 of wood. One day they woke up in the middle of the night and they were surrounded by 50 pairs of wolves, all with teeth, glittering, ravenous wolves, hungry. He woke up his other guy. He said, John, we're rich. See, you got to have the right perspective. You got to have the right perspective. If the enemy is trying to distract your prayer, that's good news. That's good news. That's good news. He's trying to distract your prayer because that means that it's already been approved. It's already on the way and hell doesn't want you to get it because he wants to keep you from making contact with God. Somebody ought to be ready to talk to God. Somebody ought to be ready to find out what God has to say and throw it back up in his face because a lot of the stuff you're asking for has already been pre-approved. It's just that in the spiritual realm, there is the attempt to block it. But if you will persevere at the Kairos time and specifically throw it back in God's face, he'll send the help needed to break it through so that you see it revealed in the physical realm.